<clears throat> Good morning. I think traffic conditions in Delhi this morning were not so bad, so our key participants have all arrived on time, and so we are starting on time. Honorable Governor Jammu and Kashmir, Sri N.N. Vora, distinguished panelists, participants, ladies and gentlemen, I feel most privileged to welcome you to the IDSA seminar on addressing the challenge of international terrorism and radicalization. This is being hosted as a precursor to the sixth ministerial meeting of the Heart of Asia Istanbul process, scheduled at Amritsar in less than two weeks on 4th December. The Heart of Asia process commenced in Istanbul five years ago in 2011 as a platform for regional cooperation with Afghanistan at its center. It seeks peace and stability in Afghanistan and security and prosperity in the region as a whole. Besides Afghanistan, 13 other countries participate in the process, along with 20 other countries and international organizations that uh, are observers. About two weeks ago, a sister institution, uh, the Indian Council for World Affairs, had hosted an international seminar on the Heart of Asia process, uh, in which some of us participated. And that focused on the role of the process members uh, in Afghanistan's development, the current status of confidence building measures among the 14 participants, measures to integrate Afghanistan in the region and promote <coughs> connectivity, counter-terrorism efforts, and regional stability and security. The IDSA seminar, uh, and there is a difference, focuses sharply on the larger challenge of terrorism and radicalization, which continue to have a devastating impact on Afghanistan and the region as a whole. It will cover the ideological dimension, its features and consequences, and cover a few country perspectives on terrorism and radicalization. The vicious terrorist bombing in Kabul yesterday that has killed three dozen persons and wounded almost 100 underlines again the need to clear the swamp of terrorism that is destroying Afghanistan and corroding the region. It is most disquieting that since the beginning of the Heart of Asia process in 2011, there has been a sharp deterioration in the security situation in Afghanistan and a resurgence of terrorism and radicalization in the wider region, completely contrary to the objectives of the initiative. Afghanistan cannot have peace and stability, and the region cannot be secure and prosperous so long as the support, sustenance, and sanctuary provided to terrorist groups is not ended and the terrorist infrastructure not dismantled. There cannot be political accommodation with terrorist groups that are organizationally or ideologically linked with Al-Qaeda and the Daesh, and who do not abjure violence and recognize human rights and fundamental freedoms that are universal. At the same time, it is clear that terrorism and radicalism cannot be uprooted by kinetic or coercive measures alone. Counter-terrorism policy has to go beyond the use of force to apprehend, disrupt, and eliminate terrorist cells and groups. It must use preventive means to alter the circumstances in which terrorism and radicalism grows. This requires national, regional, and international multilateral effort, which is the reason why India has been a votary of a comprehensive convention against international terrorism, something that has been on the table of the United Nations now for two decades. We put the draft text on the table in 1996. Along with terrorism, why is that we must equally address radicalization? It is because whatever the impulses behind terrorism, whether ethno-nationalist, religious, or left-wing, they share the traits of violent radicalization, which is a process by which persons come to adopt extremist political beliefs with a special emphasis on those ideologies that encourage violent action. Terrorism is a security threat 
to state and society. Radicalization is a social and political challenge that can more readily be tackled by non-coercive measures. All terrorists are radicalized, but all the radicalized do not become terrorists. De-radicalization targets those who have already gone astray. Counter-radicalization makes it difficult for persons to get radicalized in the first place and has a preventive impact. De-radicalization begins with the physical desegregation or disengagement with the terrorist group. And it is followed by an ideological weaning away process. And this is being tried in several countries. Counter-radicalization seeks to socially and psychologically integrate the individual through various measures. It starts with the family support system, community engagement, and reinforcing the values of human solidarity and religious values. Paradoxically, that helps in de-radicalization. And by promoting social cohesion through such innovative measures as has been tried successfully in a small country may not be a good example for large societies, but what the Singaporeans did is instructive. Their housing development board ensured distribution of public fund supported habitation across ethnicities and religious communities. It's very important in the de-radicalization process, and I have studied various examples of it, to uh, go by the genius of the people and go by the specificity of the situation. You cannot have standard wide rules for it because the biggest and widest and most expensive de-radicalization program was the one conducted uh, in a camp near Basra by the United States military between 2006 and 2009. And uh, some 20,800 persons uh, were incarcerated there and there was a big program rolled out with experts and psychologists flown in. And that program failed. It became actually a pressure cooker for the quick turnover of the detainees into uh, what we now see as ISIS. And those people who were released from that big Boka prison, uh, many of them are suspected to be the foot soldiers of Daesh. So, uh, <clears throat> and there are many lessons for those who have a scholarly bent amongst us. This is something to study, to do a comparative assessment of the success and failure of the Saudi program, the Iraqi program. Afghanistan has started to do something in this direction. And our government has also begun to move on this because uh, <clears throat> of the two dozen people who have been apprehended, uh, who have joined the Daesh or ISIS, Incidentally, for our foreign guests, I want to say that proportionate to India's population, there is a minuscule participation so far with the ISIS or Daesh. But the profiles of the individuals that uh, I have uh, had the opportunity to see, and uh, <clears throat> there, uh, it shows that of the two dozen or so, only three are above the age of 30. All of them are computer literate. Uh, many of them have exposure to uh, uh, that uh, uh, troubled part of the world, West Asia, which, uh, as we recalled in our uh, seminar here two days ago, is in a worse state uh, than at any time since the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. <clears throat> and um, so we have uh, uh, a new system of... Uh, rapid recruitment without the human interface. And, uh, and so much of these uh, contacts are developed by people who are tech savvy. And so the states that <clears throat> are involved, the, the, the numbers are more than one. The number is one for Jammu and Kashmir, but more than one for states like Kerala, Maharashtra, and uh, uh, from the Bangalore region, of course, there were a few. Karnataka. So what does it show? It shows that uh, th the recruits are not from this. It flies in the face of the argument that radicalization begins with the poorest communities. It does not necessarily. 
and uh, so, although that's also an important factor to weigh in. I'm digressing from uh, my prefatory remarks a little bit to just stress the point that this is a new and difficult area and countries are beginning to work in this direction, but scholars have a great latitude right now because uh, there is no proven method and uh, any ideas that come from think tanks would be welcome by the governments that are engaged in this task, including Government of India. To address these issues, we have panelists from India and the region, including Dr. Mustafa Zahrani, Director General of Strategic Affairs of Iran's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was earlier head of our counterpart institution, IPIS, with whom we have had very long association. Uh, Professor Haldun Yalchinkaya, coordinator of security studies program at the Center for Middle Eastern Strategic Studies, known, better known internationally as OSRAM, based in Ankara. Ambassador Abdus Samat Khadarov, security coordinator of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan. Dr. Dawood Muradian, head of the Afghan Institute of Strategic Studies, another counterpart institution, uh, but, but he has, like Dr. Zahrani, is serving now roughly in the same capacity. He served the Afghan Foreign Office and he served as an advisor to the Afghan Foreign Minister and National Security Advisor. And uh, we have Dr. Yan Shuai, Assistant Professor, China Institute of Contemporary International Relations, Kikir, again, uh, counterpart institution. They are joined by Institute's fellows, Dr. Adil Rashid, who has a, a long piece on de-radicalization out in our flagship journal, JDS. And I would invite those who haven't seen it to get hold of it. It's available on the, on the net. And, and um, Ms. Prabha Rao and Dr. Ashok Behuria. Besides, we have three eminent chairs for uh, the three sessions. Sri Chinma Ghare Khan, who had served as chairman of the International Control Commission in Laos. He was our permanent representative to the UN, first in Geneva, very early in the mid-70s, and then uh, perm rep in New York, uh, UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Middle East Peace Process, and our own government's uh, envoy for the Middle East later on. Uh, Dr. S.T. Muni, former ambassador to Laos, uh, distinguished fellow at our institute, uh, Professor Emeritus at Jawaharlal Nehru University, and Commodore Uday Bhaskar, who served this institute for several years, including as its officiating head, and is currently director of Society for Policy Studies. The opening address for our seminar is by Sri N. N. Vora, who needs no introduction to this audience. As a wise and seasoned public servant, he received the Pad Vibhushan for long years of distinguished service to the nation. He ex his experience as Defense and Home Secretary, Government of India, then as Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister, and Governor Jammu and Kashmir since 2008, makes him familiar with the issues under focus in our seminar today. We are grateful, very grateful indeed, he accepted our invitation to initiate this event. I now invite Sri Bora to deliver his address. <laughs> 